What's up, guys? Welcome back to Muscle Minds with Scott Stevenson. I'm Scott McNally. All of our programming is brought to you by Be Your Own Bodybuilding Coach, Scott's book, byobbcoach.com. You could also go to Amazon for the hardcover. I'll have links for that below. We're also, of course, brought to you by our title sponsor, truenutrition.com. They've been with us for a long time, and I'm grateful for them. Uh, you could use our code THINK for really fantastic supplements, some of the best protein powders I've ever used, tons of different flavors, really high-quality stuff. Check them out. Let me know if you have any questions. And uh, if you're in the UK, you can go to Strom Sports Nutrition. They've got some real knockout health supplements, including like great health formulas like Support Max, Support Max Joint, and check out supplementsource.ca. They've got great deals. Those deals change week to week. So keep checking out their website. They'll have something for you, I guarantee, and it will be a good price. Scott, we're going to talk about some deli meat today. That was a great question, isn't it? Yeah. We've got some really bad connection okay. issues, guys. I'm going to tell you right now, Scott's internet, we tried to reconnect a few times. It's very funky. Uh, he's got like Dave quali Dave Crossling quality video, but the audio is good. He's got some really good signs to share with us. I I've always wondered myself, you know, is deli meat good enough and good enough for bodybuilding? And that's what the question was. So I'm just going to throw it up here from DV Muscle Training. He had asked both of us on uh, DM. Uh, hi, Doctor. Hi, Doctor Stevenson. Uh, could you make a video with Scott about deli meat, sliced turkey breast, chicken breast, ham versus whole meats, chicken breast, pork loin, turkey breast on the next podcast? And guys, I encourage you not to DM us, but actually comment on the YouTube page. Uh, that's the best place for us to take questions, as well as you can DM me only on patreon speaking of which guys thank you very much everybody who supports the programming on patreon every five dollars helps so thank you for that but yeah with dms it's really hard for us to remember that's why it was like six weeks ago we got this uh, but you've got like research yeah. and stuff on this i didn't know they did research on deli meat um yeah i didn't i didn't find a ton on deli meat but i do have some some material i think that'll be kind of cool okay over. and okay. just in process food in general um, but I found processed processed meat, yeah. which is going to be deli meats and beef, processed beef. Um, so like, you know, beef, hot dogs, and that kind of kind of jazz. So let's start with a little introduction on what is what does it mean to be processed? Throw up that first um, cartoon I sent you, the first is, figure. Is this the one? Let's see. Yeah, if we can make it big. So this is from, oh, I can, if someone wants to know the article, they can, I can, I can send them to that, but it's from a review article that I thought this was a pretty nice graphic. So I'm a minimally processed, everything from minimally processed foods that are in the green, they use the color scheme I like to use, to the ultra processed foods, which are in the red, and then sort of things um, in between. So we're going from um, fresh fruit, frozen fruits, veggies, I'm reading at the bottom, examples of the foods, plain unsweetened yogurt, nuts, seeds, the kind of things you could kind of go out in nature and find like literally that could be growing in your backyard somewhere or that you could catch or hunt. Yeah. And then examples of, of highly processed foods would be like soft drinks, breakfast cereals, fast foods, salty snack foods, industrial, anything in a bag that's going to survive a nuclear apocalypse. <laughs> yeah. Um, sweets, canned instant soups, energy, right? Like all these things like soups can stay forever. They can, you can sit them on the shelf and I think they probably taste the same 10 years later. Um, chicken and fish nuggets, hot dogs, fruit drinks, and flavored yogurt. So that's kind of a – the rule of thumb I, that I, people have probably heard, but I think it's kind of nice, is is stay in the perimeter of the grocery store as much as possible. Yes. Because that's where you find the fruits and vegetables and the meats um, and yogurt and the dairy products. And we're not going to get into dairy necessarily, but that's, cause that's just by the nature of just setting up the refrigeration – and having the electrical to do that, they have all those things on the periphery of the gr of the grocery store. So the more you get into the inner aisles, where you're finding all these things in that last, um, like the, the the whole row of soft drinks, it, it's kind of amazing. You look, you go in a grocery store. You, you used to seeing this, but you go in a grocery store. Let's say someone's from Europe and they they're not used to seeing American grocery stores. For instance, things are a little different over there. And you've got a whole like two like in an aisle, two sides are filled with soft drinks. Yeah, and then you go and find water. It's like one fourth as much, right? right? Because people can drink water, of course, at home. But 
We drink so much soft drinks. The breakfast, the the bre- breakfast foods are at least one half of an entire aisle. Hmm. Yeah. It's crazy, right? And the cookies and stuff, it's just amazing. We have more of that processed stuff in our diet because this stuff tastes great. So anyway, and it's easy. That's just yeah. to kind of orient. Them. It's easy, right? You can throw it in your backpack or whatever. Um, although, you know, I was just talking about, you can take that graphic down if you want, Scott. Um, years ago, because I like to try things out, even if there's no science behind it. Like that's science comes from some sort of experience that triggers a scientist to think, ha, ah, let's test this out. And sometimes you can't formalize a scientific experiment. So in my case, I just use myself for a case study. And I did a, um, I, I ate raw, basically almost all, everything I ate was raw. Very, very rarely 5% of my diet maybe was cooked for about two years back when I lived in Arizona. Um, and I ate a, instinctively that the, and it's, this is, no one's probably going to find this. I don't think you can find it on the internet if you look it up with Google. It's called Anopsology, and I just ate intuitively. So I had a, I had a big bucket cooler, and I threw some ice ice bags in there some, uh, to keep it cool. And I would just throw in – I had uh, chubs of beef that I'd gotten from a local farmer. I knew him. Everything was organic. It wasn't certified organic, but I knew how he raised them. He was very humane to his, his – uh, his cows lived to be like 10 or 12 years old, like a full life before they were finally were sacrificed. And we went and, and picked our own fruit and vegetables. And then I got some stuff at places like Trader Joe's and Whole Foods. And everything was organic. So, you know, untouched as much as possible, unprocessed as much as possible. I just throw it in a big bucket. And then I'd eat whatever I felt like eating throughout hmm. the day, whenever I felt like eating. I would just, I would just forage. Basically, I opened the bucket. I'm like, mmm, that's sweet potatoes. And I need a raw sweet potato. Dang. This tasted great. My taste buds were so sensitive. And when I ate like a piece of fruit that was high in sugar, it was like, ah, oh, like the best dessert I've ever had. Right. Yeah. So um, that's how I ate for a while. And I felt phenomenal. I felt great doing that. Was the beef raw? I wasn't raw? trying to compete. Yeah, the beef was raw. That's why I was just yeah. making sure I, I, I had that clear. I've heard of people doing yeah. this before. I've never done it, but that's that's interesting. So yeah, but you did this, I and, knew. and what did you get from it? I felt great. Huh. I um, this was this was when I was in acupuncture school. Yeah. So I competed when I was in acupuncture school a couple times, but there was a couple years that I that I didn't compete. There was a little bit of a break I took, so I was focusing on getting board certified and all that kind of jazz. And this is how I ate, huh. and I stayed very lean without an issue. I was never hungry. I never. You know, I had never had like, oh my god, I'm just dying for some food because I always had food available. I just bragged this big is a big bucket. It was an insulated bucket. I could yeah. use it as a chair too. <laughs> so we go out like for for lunch breaks. I'd walk to the park down the street and sit on my bucket and I'd just pull out a chub of meat that was thawed out and I'd eat the meat until it was based on having a taste change. Um, and the taste change is something. This is the theory, and this seemed to work. It's pretty cool. So we've only been cooking our food for maybe 10, 12,000 years. So okay. a very short period of time, given the, the relative window of human evolution, where we basically haven't changed genetically for maybe 100,000, 200,000 years, depending on who you're listening to. So this, this is the theory of this guy named Berger. He's a French, French guy who came up with this. It's like you're changing a lot of the chemical structure by cooking things. Certainly things taste differently. Every, you cook vegetables, they taste different. Sure. Everything tastes different because you're changing the chemicals. And that's not something that we're genetically, we genetically evolved to be able to distinguish necessarily in this system of intuitive eating where our body basically tells us what we need. So you have situations where people are eating like it's called pie they're eating non-food items that can sometimes be associated with vitamin or mineral deficiencies. Right. Obviously, if you're lacking in macronutrients, you look for nutrient ditch dense foods. You eat like high calorie stuff because you need the calories. But there's also some instances of people needing micronutrients. Well, his theory is that your body can basically sense all of this. This is this was something that co-evolved with us that we lost track of with cooking food first and foremost, and now with all the processing. Yeah. You've got this mass of crazy chemicals that are flowing in and your body doesn't know how to decipher that because it's not part of the the input language that it evolved to be able to decipher to tell your body what to seek out food wise do you need more of of, of a particular kind of meat or a, a particular berry or whatever it might be do you need more something with more roughage in it or any of the other phytochemicals that we don't have any usrda for that have not like all the all so many phytonutrients have tremendous health benefits. You see this 
anyway, teas and spice first things. So that was just kind of my aside into eating this way. And it was, I felt phenomenal. I felt great. I was strong in the gym. Um, I, during that period of time, I actually fasted. I think I've told this story. I fasted for nine days. I think we, I had two salads during the course of nine days. <laughs> and on the last day before the fast, I went in the gym um, to train because I was training during that a little bit. I'm like, I'm going to just go for it and see how much strength I've lost. And I did a stiff-legged deadlift with 405 for 10 reps all the way to the ground. <laughs> okay. I was Damn. weighing like 190, 195. Okay, I was pretty wow. strong at those. That, like, wow. And that was after a, like no food. Like, yeah. I had 600 calories over the pre- previous eight days. Yeah. And I – when I maintain my, so that, uh, but that was cause that strength had been maintained eating this way. Um, and I wasn't trying to body build. I was just training, but I just maintained my strength. Um, okay. Anyway, so that's on the side. So let's, let's go to the next, the next picture and we can, um, talk a little bit more about some mechanisms just to get a, an idea. This is just kind of a really cool picture. So this is how, the, and this is just on cardiovascular disease. Okay. The impact of Oops. ultra processed food. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of this. Folks can maybe take a, um, a screen capture and they can take a look at this. But we've got um, additives and inorganic sweet, and artificial sweeteners, emulsifiers, high fat, saturated fat, trans fat. You really don't find that so much anymore here in the U.S. Refined sugars, high glycemic index, high glycemic load. And then so you end up causing oxidative stress you throw off your blood lipids for saturated fats for instance you can tend to cause dysglycemia and insulin resistance Mm -hmm. um high sodium causes uh hypertension in some people um if you eat some of these some of these foods can tend to cause you to eat more than you would otherwise so that tends to bring you towards obesity Mm -hmm. we got this creeping obesity notion where it just takes about a saltine crackers worth of excess calories to explain why it is that the average American gains about a pound of body weight after the age of 25 or 30 until they're about 50. Mm. They lose a half pound of fat free mass. They gain about a pound and a half of fat. Damn. So they gain a pound of body weight, body composition change. It's just a little bit of excess. It's not accommodated for, Yeah, um, not countered by your metabolism and a company with, with um, sedentary living. You throw off, you have endothelial dysfunction. And when you're eating all this crap, you're eating less fruits and vegetables yeah. Lower fiber because there's less fiber in there, so you have an that has an impact on your microbiome. Uh, fiber is is important for the um, for the microbiome. It's the food basically, um, the the probiotics or the prebiotics for your probiotics, which are the which are the bacteria. So all this is kind of this is just for cardiovascular, but this is kind of a nice figure to show. It's like if you think about it, it's like oh my god, just eating all this processed food, you can imagine. You go into you know, Costco is a place where you'll see this because there's lots of highly processed stuff in there in large amounts. Yeah. Or if you just take a kinder in the um, in the shopping cart of people that you oftentimes end up at. It depends on where you shop, of course. But you go to your kind of typical big box grocery store mm-hmm. and you look at what people are eating and you're like, like everything is processed. Yeah. So, like 80 um, percent. So you can imagine like. All these facts are all these things are compounding on itself, and cardiovascular disease is a gigantic killer. Um, and it's you know, and the, these things are all interrelated with one another: obesity, hypertension, um, insulin resistance, or, or pre-diabetes. So, um, this is just like a, I thought that was a really cool, really cool uh, figure I wanted to throw up at people. So that's a general thought. Okay. So. Back to the question. You might want to throw it up so people know where where we're at. Yeah, um, I'll I'll just read it again. He just asked. Uh, uh-huh. He just wanted to know about deli oh. meat versus whole foods, chicken breast, pork loin, turkey, versus sliced turkey breast to chicken breast and ham. Okay, so let's throw up this last figure I sent you. All right. So this and this one. The reference Larson et al. or Larson and Arsini there. It's, yeah. um, this is a, uh, a meta analysis that was okay. done, and we're not going to. This is this is what's called a um, uh, a forest plot. So they looked at unprocessed red meat, and this is uh, processed red meat and total red meat, and its impact on 
all cause mortality. So oh. basically your likelihood to, not, to die. Yeah. <laughs> not from cardiovascular disease per se or just in general. So it's a really nice um, measurement of your general health status. Okay. So unprocessed red meat, which would be just like raw red meat, mm -hmm. for instance, um, didn't have, you can see if you look in that top cluster of points in the middle there, that middle line um, suggests relative risk and that, that top, it's an open kind of a diamond shape. Uh -huh. That is the, the some relative risk statistic for unprocessed red meat. And it barely is connected with the middle line. So that means it wasn't significant. Okay. If we go down a little bit, you see another cluster of points. That's the processed meat. And there you see a, an increased relative risk of dying. Mm. Um, and the value is 1.23. So I'd have to go and look and see what that means in terms of years and how they, uh, cause there's, these are tons of studies. That's why I wanted to actually show this. Um, but there was an increased relative risk just for taking in more processed red meat, like the stuff that's being asked about in this question. So anything that is um, been processed and put inside a bag, like a hot dog or deli meat, um, I think this probably would include, yeah, like, like um, beef jerky, that okay. sort of thing. Eating processed red meat increases your risk of dying, basically. Hmm. You can look up the details. I'm not going to, I don't want to spend too long because you could dig in this for forever. And they also found a relative risk for total red meat. Really? In this particular. And it was a little bit higher. So, yeah. So that was, that's probably because processed red meat and total red meat are, are going to be associated. Unprocessed red meat in and of itself did not have an effect. So that's the first cluster of points. Okay. Um, so, so the interesting thing, you look at, at all those, so you have that middle line there, um, which is a, relative risk of one, so no increased or decreased risk. Yeah. And all of those points come from the studies that they listed on each line there. Yeah. Uh, and you can see there's a high diversity of um, relative risks based on the findings of each of these different studies. Yeah. Because those, those, you don't see all those points lining up like one, one under the other. Mm -hmm. So, and the lines, those lines are, are um, confidence intervals for each of those. So, Basically, it's, it's a marker of the variability and or of the of the findings and how confident they, they can say that the relative risk was what they found the average relative risk to be. Yeah, um, it's everywhere, all over the place. So that's kind of the that's kind of the issue, and that's probably why he's asking this because you will hear a study, and this is like someone talked about a um, a study that's being published, I guess, at this this weekend at some conference in Iran. Um, that was about uh, what was that study about, Scott? Someone asked about it. Um, oh, I can't remember. And, they asked in the Facebook yeah. group for Think Big. Yeah, I, I can't right. remember offhand. Yeah, about, about processed rice and it's it oh being yeah, it's candy. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. yeah. So there, yes, yeah, so there's one study that came out, and well, I couldn't read the study, so we couldn't discuss that. I, you need to have the study. You can't really trust those news sources. They 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 want to hit you with whatever they possibly can. Whatever sounds the most. Yeah. Um, right. So that's one particular study that showed an adverse effect of, of processed rice, I think, in this case. Don't quote me on that. But that's an example of what some of these studies, when they had come out, I'm sure they made the press, they made the news and say, oh, it's okay to eat as much processed meat as you want, or yeah. it's okay to eat meat isn't, isn't an issue, and then others find something different. So that's why a meta-analysis can be, can be good. So the, the studies generally show the things we just talked about. Um, processed red meat and total red meat consumption increase your risk of just flat out dying, basically. Can I ask you um, something, Scott, about so, this? Yeah, yeah, please. Right. So somebody, say, who is eating a lot of junk food, just in general, and we can include processed meat in that, mm -hmm. are they, I would yeah. imagine they're probably somebody who's also not taking as good a care of their health. They're like, I think in the bodybuilding yeah. sense, my guess is the person who's asking is probably doing everything else right. He's doing cardio and training and mm -hmm getting vitamins and, and, you know, hopefully eating vegetables and good quality carbohydrates. But he's asking himself, like he's asking us, Hey, can I substitute that meat for this lunch meat? If I, I would have to think that he would not fit in with the average. My guess is that if you're eating a lot of junk food, that may be a reflection of how well you take care of yourself overall. Am I, what, what do you think? 
Yeah, they mention that in these studies. Oh, I mean, this is this is something. Yeah, it, it, it's a confounding factor, right? Um, that sometimes, for instance, actually low meat consumption in general is associated with a healthier lifestyle. Okay. Um, and you, they try to account for that statistically to some degree because they, they also will often quantify and you know, where the data come from, quantify what those other activities are, and then you can statistically remove those influences and see if there's an independent effect yeah. of just the meat consumption. But it's hard to do that because you don't know what the interactions are necessarily and whether those two things are synergizing in some way. Yeah. Um, and bodybuilders, exactly, they're a completely different animal because um, they're the teensy, weensy, small part of the of the, um, the population. Right. Especially the ones who are competitive. And then if we're talking about people who are using gear, using PEDs, now you've got someone who's eating maybe a whole lot of really healthy food. Maybe they have a lot of, of fruits and vegetables in their diet. Yeah. Um, maybe they don't. That's a confounding factor that sometimes isn't measured um, that has to be taken into consideration. They may be taking a bunch of health-related supplements that are in some way a surrogate for those. So they use um, an antioxidant blend of some sort. Right. Right. And that's one where I can all mention here in a second. Um, for instance, nitrites or nitrates, these um, nitroso compounds and nitroso compounds um, are carcinogenic. And part of that is probably because they have an oxidative action. Hmm. So taking an antioxidant like vitamin C or things that are found in fruits and vegetables can counter that. Right. So we're kind of, kind of getting in the mix, mixing the data. And so that's exactly the thing. This is just the relative risk on average for people who are quite average and bodybuilders are not average. That's their intention is not to be average. Hmm. They also exercise more than the average person. Yeah. Some are doing lots of cardio. Yeah. Um, just being out of the bottom, like the bottom quintile, the bottom quartile of exercise activity um, has a dramatic effect on all cause, all cause mortality hmm. in general. So it's just not being like a complete couch potato right? has a big, big impact. Um, extreme exercise can actually increase the risk of dying. No kidding. There's some, there's some data that indicated that. And this is like, you know, people are running marathons and that sort of thing. Some of that can be that you're, you're obviously stressing yourself. Yeah. Um, there, you have an increased risk of having a heart attack when you're, when you're exercising, doing endurance exercise, for instance. But on average, if you're exercising at a moderate to, you know, not extraordinary, like you're not trying to run triathlons or marathons, that exercise has a protective effect against dying. Mm -hmm. But you have an increased risk while you're exercising. So if you're someone who's exercise, running like three or four hours a day um, and all the stress that goes along with that, it's a whole other animal. Yeah. Um, but those people aren't necessarily, you don't see them represented in these samples. Yeah. So it's kind of like, Imagine you take a thousand people and you take a picture and there's one bodybuilder in there, right? Right. I mean, bodybuilders are one out of a thousand. Um, and you say, what's the average, you know, what's, what do these people look like? And you make a composite person and there would be nothing in that composite person that looks remotely like a bodybuilder. Right. Because only even no, regardless if it was Nick Walker or Ronnie Coleman or whoever, they've been averaged out and they're not representative. So that, so that population of bodybuilders is not represented in the population that was sampled here. So it's it's an it's a, it's um it doesn't it doesn't apply basically to some degree to bodybuilders. Yeah. But that doesn't mean the information is useless because we're seeing some, there's some effect there and we're yeah. all humans, we're all biological beings and we've got some commonalities um despite the fact that many of us feel like we're superhuman and that's that includes I felt like that sometimes to myself like I can just do whatever I want, I want to my body and I'll I get away with it. That's a that's a misnomer. <laughs> but you're right. It's, it's hard to know because the bodybuilders sometimes are really, especially now they're really health conscious in many, many ways, but they're also doing things, if they're taking PEDs, for instance, that are having adverse effects. Yeah. And your relative susceptibility is unknown. Hmm. I, I always think of, because I'll never forget this, one of the, the cardiologists at the clinic where my dad worked when I was growing up was a vegetarian, so low, <laughs> low meat intake, obviously. He was doing what he thought was best health-wise. And he also ran marathons. And he was a cardiologist. Yeah. Um, he had a heart attack when he was out running, and he had to have a quadruple bypass. Good God. Yeah. It happens. Yeah. You don't know no matter how healthy like, you are. What the hell? Yeah. He was well, he, he, healthy in what way? No matter how many health practices you adopt. Okay. Yeah. 
health yeah, practices thing, versus being well, healthy. Yeah. Right, or or having the biological processes that are underpinning the development of this disease, and you know, cardiovascular disease is the silent killer, right? Right, you know it's coming. But and I, I would imagine, I mean, sometimes there's also data suggesting that that doctors aren't the best as far as health practices in general. I've they heard tend that. to smoke a little bit average, more than, or at least years ago, I know they, they they don't exercise as much, and they tend to smoke a little bit more than your average person, yeah. even though they know, right? Um, so I don't know if he was doing his blood work. This was like, you know, this is when I was a kid. This was 40 years ago, probably when this happened. Um, to know that like, he had a horrible blood lipid profile. Yeah. But he was someone, if anyone who would think would have taken every, and he had apparently taken every major precaution that he could to prevent cardiovascular disease, he still got it. Hmm. It still happened. So that's the thing you don't know until maybe you get a genetic profile um, that might reveal to you, like, oh gosh, I got a super high risk for colorectal cancer which for instance can be the risk of which can be increased by the formation of a couple compounds that are found in meat hey guys i'm going to take a brief pause to shout out our advertisers i'm going to try to make this quick but keep in mind they're responsible for helping us to put these shows out if you guys want to support our programming of course you can do so through patreon and thank you to everybody who supports the show through patreon i will have links to that below as well as to all of our advertisers if you shop with our advertisers you'll get great products products that i stand behind and you'll also be supporting our programming First of all, check out truenutrition.com if you're in the U.S. I use their hydrolyzed beef collagen every day, and I use their citrulline malate, beta alanine, and EAA on days that I train. They have high-quality protein powders and tons of flavors. Hit me up if you have any questions. Use our code THINK over there. You'll get some additional savings, plus you'll support our programming, and you'll get some high-quality third-party tested supplements. If you're in Canada, check out supplementsource.ca. They have blowout deals on top name brand supplements. Uh, they constantly have different things happening. So be sure to go to their site and check them out. I recently saw Carbolin for like 30 bucks off. I mean, you really can't beat those prices. Plus they have free shipping over $99. If you're in the UK, then you probably already know about Strom Sports. They're one of the leader in health supplements in the United Kingdom. Strom Sports Nutrition has standalone supplements like NAC and Tutka, and they have finished blends like Support Max, a high quality, well-priced on-cycle support stack. I have links below to everything. Thanks for watching. Thanks for your support. Hmm. All so, meat, not just that lunch was my meat. Next, uh, red meat in particular. And I don't okay. know to what extent of the other meat. I had, like I said, I... I would normally, like, if I write an article on this, I would go and it would probably take me about 30 hours to put it together. Yeah. I spent more like an hour looking at okay. gathering together these big that sort of stuff. So, um, so as far as ischemic heart disease or cancer or, um, which we'll talk about, what are the, what are the mechanisms that are involved here? Well, for one thing, if you're someone who's salt sensitive and you start eating a lot of processed meats, Mm -hmm. Getting back, deli meats, they're loaded with salt. Yeah. Sometimes it's, if you read the, the labels, it's like, how did they get so much sodium in there? <laughs> Amazing. You can like one, like a three ounce serving has 1200 milligrams of sodium or something like that. It's yeah. Like, oh my God. So that'll increase your blood pressure. If you're an off season guy, I mean, you, you can imagine the scenario. You're off season. You're trying to get the food down. You're getting tired of eating kind of bland meat. So you're like, you know, you just go and get like, um, like a honey baked ham. Right, right. right. I, I'm not hitting on, I don't know what honey baked ham has sodium wise, but of I course. imagine it's, it's not low. Right. But that tastes great. That stuff's, that stuff's awesome. So you eat that because you want to get your protein and you just need to find something to eat. And you're already tending to hold water because you've been pushing the food, et cetera, et cetera. And now you have even higher blood pressure if you're sodium sensitive and you exacerbate things. Absolutely. And you do that because you're just trying to make the gains. You just push, push, push because you're knuckleheaded and you want to win and you want to get bigger and you have high, high blood pressure for three months during an off season. And then you have kidney damage, let's say because of that. Yeah. Because of the, the, the hypertension as an example. So the salt's a big, a big deal. Um, one reason to kind of avoid those. And uh, do you have a question? I heard, I thought I heard everyone brewing. No, I'm just trying to breathe. Okay. You know, my, right. sometimes I think you think I'm like, uh, okay. doing something and I'm just like, just trying to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's the delay and then i'm looking at my notes here so oh. I, I, I thought i heard a question and then and you actually out for a sec um so there's two things that are formed when you cook meat red meat okay. in particular um heterocyclic amines and people probably have heard about these and um polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons so okay. 
Um, you can you guys can look those up. Basically, these are molecules that are formed, um, and you can actually these are car carcinogenic, um, particular uh, car uh, colorectal cancer, so colon cancer, and you can actually um, minimize those pretty substantially by microwaving your meat um, for several minutes. You don't have to cook it with the microwave, but microwaving it seems to help. Huh, okay. And then I found a night, a cool study that people want the, um, yeah, it's kind of cool. I, I knew about that for forever. That, so that work came out like decades ago. And if you, um, to get rid of the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, if you let the smoke get off, leave the meat. So don't necessarily cover it while you're, yeah. while you're cooking it. And I, I like to do that. So it cooks it more evenly. Yeah. But, that smoke is trapping this carcinogen and then let the drippings drop off. So make sure, um, you know, you've got plenty of holes in your grill. Let's say when you're grilling things, this was in the case of grilling. So you want to let those things leave the meat, huh. the drippings and the smoke, and that will reduce the content of the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. No kidding. So, yeah. Um, so processed meats also have these um, nitrosyl compounds. Nitrite's the one people know, and there's a bunch of others that can be formed, and they're they're put in there as an anti for for um, as a preservative, basically as an antibacterial. Right. Um, but but basically, like 85, 90 percent of them are carcinogenic, like almost all carcinogenic. I've heard that, um, and and I think we have a hard time, yeah, like getting rid of those once they're in our bodies, don't we? Yeah, I'm not sure how they stay, what their half life is, but they're definitely not good. They're not okay. cool. Um, but the there are um, uh, nitrosation inhibitors in fruits and vegetables, things that are like antioxidants, for instance. Oh. So vitamin C is one that's known to do that. Huh. So if you're going to eat your meat, I'm trying to break. I tried to make this real simple for this time instead of getting into like <laughs> up chemical pictures of chemicals and that, right? If you're going to eat your meat, then fruits and vegetables are going to be to your advantage. So vitamin C, for instance, you know, high vitamin C, things like oranges, what have you. Yeah. Um, not a bad choice. So and I tell you what, like I, I just thought of my, my buddy, he probably watched this, Mike Gustafson, um, yeah. who lives in Thailand for a while. And he was just eating, eating fish and pineapple when he was there, just real basic diet. And he said he looked almost as best he's ever looked. <laughs> um, and the pineapple's delicious. He wasn't avoiding carbs. He wasn't doing a ketogenic diet. He was just eating the fish that he could get, you know, at yeah. the fish market and just tons of pineapple because it was readily available. Um, and so you can look really good with meat and fruit if you're looking for something that's sustainable. Yeah. And that's highly unprocessed. Hmm. So don't get the processed meat. Avoid the nitroso compounds. You have the benefits of the endogenously found antioxidants, all the, um, all the phytochemicals that are the polyphenols that are found in fruits and veggies that are to tremendous health benefits. Yeah. They turn on our own antioxidant system as well and, and basically make ourselves better at handling toxins. Hmm. Um, and then if you're going to cook your meat, um, warm it up in the microwave, cook a little bit in the microwave, like kind of pre-cook it. So it's just getting a little brown, I think is the rule of thumb. Um, and maybe even I like to kind of chop my meat up before I grill it a lot of times so that it cooks evenly throughout. I don't have to like burn the outside. Yeah. Um, that's probably the, some of the issues with the formation of these car carcinogens. So let it, let the microwave um, heat it inside as well. Hmm. And then when you cook it, let the, let the, let the neighbors know you're cooking. Right. So let the smoke come off Yeah. and then make sure you don't, you don't trap any drippings. So you can press on the meat to get the drippings to fall out. Sure. And that reduced the, those two things will reduce the um, the uh, carcinogens. Those three things: the, the microwave, letting the smoke, and letting the drippings leave. That's cool. Yeah, I had no idea about that. I mean, I've always known the yeah. the whole like burnt meat can have a carcinogen in it, but I I never knew at this level, mm -hmm. uh, and I never knew outside of not burning your meat that you could do more than that. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know if bur if like because it's nice to have grilled veggies too, right? Yeah, it just tastes good. But you, I don't know, you, you may, I have to go and look and see to what extent you're reducing the antioxidant com content in that. Sometimes cooking things increases content of certain molecules because it causes transformations. It can be good, actually. Hmm. So it's, it varies on an individual basis. But, yeah, you have, like, you know, some fruits, and like a big salad and, and meat. I mean, if, if, if you don't need the carbs because we're training, see, that's the thing. We're training so hard. Mm -hmm. um, we need carbohydrates. 
Um, you could probably get it. I mean, a, a cool experiment would be someone to avoid, avoid rice, let's say, and see if you can if you can get your calories from from berries um, and uh, things like papaya. Um, mm. Sweet potatoes are difficult. You can do that. There's lots of fiber in there, and see if you can get enough carbohydrate that way. Yeah, um, it'd be very difficult. And the problem the, here, here's the problem is that. You go to the process, like the example I gave with the processed meat, or like if we want to talk about rice, when you're going to the extent that someone is when they're the size of, you know, a pro level bodybuilder or even like, you know, a heavy or a super heavy or someone who's just extraordinarily advanced, mm -hmm. your weight, you're, you're trying, the whole point of that is you're using training which tricks your body to build muscle, you're overfeeding yourself, you're going way beyond your appetite, um, there may be P PEDs that are involved, you're doing everything to basically hack into the biological mechanisms that allow you to gain muscle um, in a way that Mother Nature had never prepared you for. Yeah. So you're trying to take a Pinto and turn it into an Indy 500 car. Right? Yeah, yeah. And some people are. They, they think the more drugs they, 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 can, they, can make, make, they can make the Pinto into a Ferrari, and that's it, not going to happen, right? Um, but if everyone... I mean, Ronnie Coleman suffered some physical issues, you know, and some of that may be into his surgeries, but everyone has some breakdown, others more, some more than others. But when you're pushing that, that hard, competitive bodybuilding is not healthy. It's way yeah. beyond the normal homeostatic mechanisms that say, okay, you know what? I feel like I'm going to throw up. I should stop eating. It's like, no, I have three more bites and I'm not going to let that bowl of food beat me. Right. 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 So you suffer consequences. And when you go to eating, unclean if we can talk about level of processing per that first graph we put up being related to how clean a food is people go to unclean foods because they need to get the calories in absolutely you know yeah and that's where you suffer health adverse health effects the so processed meats is as easy as they are oh man i don't even i don't know i, I can even taste and my taste buds aren't super sensitive in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. But I, when I have processed things like that, I just have the sense like this is this can't be good for me. Maybe I'll use I know too much but. at times. I'll use um, uh, what is it? Boar's Boar's head lunch meat. I, I don't make mm -hmm. it like a a big part of my diet. But if I feel like I'm having a harder time eating, if I pick up a pound of that. I might end up making a few sandwiches and that helps to kind of like bridge some stuff. Maybe I'll do that plus have a shake or something. I just, the logistics though of replacing all of my meat in a meal with lunch meat. Like if I buy a pound, I might have like a little sandwich here and there and that's going to last me a week. Um, but I, right. I couldn't imagine eating a pound of lunch meat or, you know, half a pound of lunch meat all at once. That's a hell of a sandwich that you'd have to make hell of a pile of lunch meat, you know? Right, right. And think, and, and that's the thing. Like, the sodium, when you talked about the sodium in it or, you know, the nitrates, like all that stuff is going to be just through the roof if you're eating like five servings of it at a time. And that's only once a day. Imagine if you're eating five servings five times, you know? Mm hmm. That'd be There's pretty bad. One, I'll read the quote from a study um, from two, 2021. Um, and it says higher consumption of unprocessed red meat was associated with a relative risk. Um, per 50 grams of day, per 50 grams higher intake per day of 9% greater relative risk of ischemic heart disease. Hmm. Um, if you were, if for every 50 grams a day of processed red meat, there was an 18% higher risk of ischemic heart disease. In okay. Particular, huh. uh, meta analysis. So, I mean, how much like bodybuilders may be taking in 250 grams of protein? Yeah. So is that linear? Can we can we go? You know, we, can we take that out to, you know, if you go to, you have, you had an extra 150 grams of, of protein or grams of meat, the meat or protein of, of grams of grams of meat per day. So not okay. protein, but meat. So that's a lot of meat, actually. Yeah. Can you double your relative risk of ischemic heart disease. I don't know. Huh. The compound the compounding factors that come into come into play there. Like what what are people what does someone's diet look like who takes in 150 grams of, of uh, like they're eating a deli sandwich every day? Like yeah. Maybe they go, does um, Subway have deli meat? They have <clears throat> yeah, yeah, they do. There's a deli meat, right? I don't think it's yeah. very good quality so either. Go 
I, I'm guessing not, right? Yeah. Um, so some people go there all the time. You know, they may they may do 100 grams of deli meat every day. That may yeah. that may increase their if they're that average. That may increase their relative risk of you know ischemic heart disease by yeah. a third. Yeah, you don't think so though. You think Subway is the healthier choice? Which hey, maybe it's not as bad as like getting a double Whopper or something every day, but. Yeah, right. I made the mistake, Scott, of early, early on, um, I wanted to get extra protein in in bodybuilding. I knew if I ate more protein, uh, I could get in good shape. And I knew that I, I wanted to get lean. So I was going to Subway for lunch every day. And I got their tuna sandwich, though I didn't calculate the amount of fat from the mayo. And I, because I wanted the extra protein, I was like, give me a double tuna scoop, you know? And I, I think I calculated I was getting like a hundred, like I did this for a whole summer, like I said, years, decades ago. And I was getting like a hundred grams of fat in that meal alone, which. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. It was really healthy. Showed at the end of the summer? What's that? Did it show at the end of the summer? Did it show at the no, end of the No, because I was doing so much work to get in shape and doing all the Remember? cardio and all the other right. meals were were fairly right. good. That was like the one thing. Like while I was at work, I was going to go get that. I was That meal was covered because I knew I could go to Subway and get that and have those carbs. And yeah, well, like I said, That's decades like, ago. Yeah, but like 900 calories, like, was it four or five times a day? Four times a week, I mean? Uh, Yeah, five, probably five. I think yeah. I worked full time. At, yeah. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's, that's your deficit. If you're trying to lose fat right there times two yeah. for some people. Just think of man, you know, imagine, is an hour of cardio. imagine the progress I could have made had I just pulled that out. Like I probably would have gotten, cause I got leaner. I got abs and stuff, you know, imagine if I would have pulled that out, that would have been crazy. It would have been shredded. <laughs> oh, the things we've done. Yeah. Yeah. But you learn so much in doing that, you know. Like you'll never forget that. No, you'll, God no. You look God, for no. mayo. Yeah, like you know, you know that mayo. It's funny because powerlifters. That's one of the rules that I've heard powerlifters talk about. Is put mayo in everything. Oh right? yeah, add the extra you calories. Put right? put mayo. Yeah, put mayo in your pizza. Put mayo in your Ooh. all your meats. Like, yeah. <laughs> Dang. You can you can get big fast with mayo. Yeah, I like the sound sure. of that. Not big with the way we want though. <laughs> that's the only problem. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so hopefully that gives some insight into the processed meat thing and processed foods. And, um, yeah, maybe scare some people off. Who knows? We may have saved a life today, Scott. You what? Oops. So we may have saved a life today with this little little tirade on processed foods. We could have. I uh, I, I wanted to talk about uh, some training stuff, but I we talked all about that other stuff before the show, uh, and I ran out of time. Oh. I have to run, unfortunately. Oh, all right. uh, but yeah, you got stuff to do. All right. I, I think the the moral of the story is probably not eat lunch meat in place of that's at least what I get out of this. Mm -hmm. Don't eat lunch meat mm -hmm. in place of regular meat. Now, I remember a story of um, Dave Pulsanella. Uh, he told this on his old podcast, you know, years ago, that when he was a kid, mm -hmm. he would shoplift. Uh, deli meat from the grocery store so that he could get all his protein in and he would eat like a ton of deli meat and he was like shoplifting it from the store every day to get his protein in huh. and they uh, um, they ended up nicknaming him deli meat Dave on the podcast for for that reason but he was hammering the lunch meat to get his protein in that's crazy that. yeah you remember that one yeah, I do. I remember the deli meat day part. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, that was why. Like, you're not going to see those. You, you know, people don't get cancer often. Very. I think we got a delay here. We're back on track now. All um, right. You know, people aren't getting. You know, they're not having ischemic heart disease that they notice when they're twenty, thirty. Yeah. Or they're not getting. You know, cancer can take a long time to develop. Who knows? You know, when the the trigger moment may be, but you know, he's not going to notice that now. Right. Even now, you know, he's probably no adverse effects. Well, he but moved to the six foods that were lifetime and deli meat was not one of them. Ah, I yeah. shudder. <laughs> All right. We've got a terrible leg here. So let's wrap this thing up. Guys, we appreciate you tuning in. Uh, thanks for hanging with us. Uh, don't eat deli meat. There's that. And uh, eat lots of fruits and vegetables and make sure you uh, you, you microwave your meat first. Although yeah. I feel like that's going to 
mess the flavor up. That's going to happen. You make sure you let the smoke rise off your meat and, uh, you know, make sure that it, uh, you let the drippings fall through. That's our, that's our lesson for the day. Uh, check out, uh, be your own bodybuilding coach, B Y O B B coach.com. There is no lag when you read Scott's book. It's absolutely perfect, crystal clear, crisp, and decisive. Uh, you can go to uh, uh, Amazon. You can get the hardcover there. And of course, check out our sponsors. I already mentioned that at the beginning. You can reach out to me, McNallyDiets at gmail.com. Hit me up for coaching. And uh, that's all we got for you for another episode of Muscle Minds with the one and only Scott Stevenson. We'll see you pretty soon, guys. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, sir. Thank you, sir.